Chris Baker Radio Show. Well, one day I'm walking along the State Fair and with some friends and we've all got little kids with us and we're walking along. We're broadcasting live from the fair. We came upon a, a booth where some people were broadcasting a radio show. I'm telling you, I believe sometimes people deserve killing. Of course they do. And they're talking about when is it okay to kill your wife? We're broadcasting live from the fair and coming up with good excuses to shoot your wife here on... <laughs> <laughs> People are calling in saying when they think it would be okay to kill their wife. Yeah, I'd shoot uh, the wife. You shoot, <laughs> you yeah, you shoot them, you sit down, you have dinner, you call the police and say, <laughs> this is what I... How can this idea of killing women be at a state fair and be so accepted? At the same time, we've got story after story after story in this state of women being brutally murdered in these situations. We need to look historically at where this violence comes from. It costs me a lot But there's one thing that I've got It's my man It's my man Cold or wet Tired your bet All of this I'll soon forget With my man He's not much on looks He's no hero out of books, but I love him. When people think of sexual assault, prostitution, they think of pornography, they think of domestic violence, and they think of them as separate issues. But they're really all the same issue. They're really about uh, the domination and degradation of women. The gang rape in California recently where you had a young girl who was raped and then boys came by and watched, took pictures with their cell phones. And they were taught since a very young age that girls, that they're better than girls, and they're taught to look at girls as sexual objects. And so it's very easy to abuse and to witness the abuse of an object. And that's the real tragedy, I think, is that we've somehow raised a whole generation of kids who think that their life is, is bounded, bounded by sexual violence, and that that's just the way it goes. We need to really look at the history, that this is not something that just started in 1980 or 90. We need to find out what it was that we created that promoted so much violence against women. And if we understand the history behind it, then we can move forward. The Puritans are religious dissident Protestants who come to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They see the husband as the head of a very orderly family that will support the orderly society of the time, but there are some men who are not orderly enough. The entire attitude towards rape, I think, in colonial America was a sense that male sexual aggression was normal. We know that during the colonial period and the colonial expansion period and the early history of this country, Native women were, were viewed essentially as sexual objects. A lot of the early colonial uh, powers called them the petticoat governments because they were oftentimes a very egalitarian system. In some cases, the women had the power and the men treated the women with respect. And oftentimes that triggered a response of uh, disgust and that the colonial powers would decide that they were gonna teach those men how to treat their women. So that was the beginning for Native women. The boarding school era was probably the worst. A significant percentage of those children were sexually abused and or physically abused. So this multi-generational trauma has continued and this is part of the vulnerability that we see in Native families today. Before the American Revolution, in general, rape was a hanging crime, a capital offense. The reforms after the revolution tend to make it a much more likely that it'll be a capital offense when it is a black man. We see castration 
as a possible punishment for a black man. So the deep racial aspect of rape punishment goes way back in American history. The experience of women living in settlements where they're pretty far from their neighbors is that often the battering meant that the woman was thrown out of doors. She's literally locked out of her house, and sometimes in the night, in the dark, and she probably is injured. Usually what the neighbors say is, well, now you're better, and I'm gonna call on your husband, and we're gonna see if you, the two of you can reconcile and live together under one roof. In the women's suffrage movement, there are women such as Stanton and Anthony who are not ta just talking about the radical idea that women should have the vote. They're also talking about this radical idea that women need to get a divorce if there is abuse and cruelty in the marriage. In the 1930s and 40s, one of Freud's disciples, Helena Deutsch, develops this idea of the female masochism. I think it's extremely popular in psychiatric casework, uh, family casework, because uh, they're asking themselves uh, the question, that there must be something wrong with this woman. She's in a dependent relationship. She must have some kind of deep psychological problems. I'm here today to speak in favor of the proposed changes to the probable cause arrest law when I, when I started this work in the late 1970s, when shelters first opened up and women started coming into these shelters, they were telling stories that were, for the first time many people were hearing. The media was picking it up, they were testifying at, at legislative hearings, they, they were out there telling the story of what it's like to live like this. This state did a tremendous response to that. Open shelters, created good legislation. And now you're seeing all that backlash and other people claiming the voice and becoming the authority and these women's voices just disappearing. I was furious. I, I, I started choking her and I felt something pop. I heard something pop in my head and I got up and looked at my hands and I looked at my wife and she was, you know, gagging and gasping for air and I thought I killed my wife. Abuse went on for a lot of years that didn't go reported and that when it did get reported, she would drop the charges. Black eye, marks around her arms, black and blue marks on her legs, hair pulled out. At that point, I actually thought it was okay to do those things. It's just like, what did you, you know, you caused all this. It's not me, you caused this. Not only are we beating and raping women at astounding rates, but we're being entertained by depictions of, of violence and rape. We're seeing sexualization of women uh, and exploitation of women at, at rates we've never seen in the past. The access to pornography in some of those images is, is uh, unprecedented. We're seeing the sexual exploitation of children and trafficking of children that we haven't seen in the past. We know that the average age of entry into prostitution is 12 to 14. The homicide rate for women who've been prostituted is 40 times higher than the general population. And we're not paying any attention to this. And that has to change. Our belief that a man's home is his castle, that we're going to try to keep the family together at all costs, that we have a long tradition of accepting punishment are all fundamental beliefs and barriers to really doing much about family violence. He isn't true. He beats me too. What can I do? I think that it's important for us to take a deep, deep look at this this kind of gender-based violence and ask the question, what are the structures that we play, put in place that fosters this kind of continued violence against women? And we need to, to, to see where that violence comes from and then respond in a multifaceted way to that violence. For whatever my man is, I'm his. Forever, 
Bye.